Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Hardware. And man, I gotta tell you guys, I have been on fire the last couple weeks. Um, so last weekend, or no, last week I didn't stream. Uh, I can't remember why, but I didn't. But in the meantime, I did a couple things. The first thing I did was I was able to get Kaze to a relatively releasable state. I mean, it's not... Like, one of the reasons I wanted to just kind of push it out, even though it's still missing a lot of features, was because I figured it was just better that way, and then I wouldn't, like, sit there and worry about it and think about, oh, I gotta do this, gotta do this. It would, it just made it made me relax more if I just pushed it as is, even though it's missing a couple things. Um, and I've been really happy with that decision, because um, it's, it's made it really easy to get it into other projects and other test projects, and it's also made me uh, aware of how it's going to look here, and it also forced me to push... Um, push some kind of documentation on everything else so it's like uh it just it just forced me to get things done enough which i think is is kind of what i needed to get uh to get past that last little bit um so i think the major features that it's still missing uh is that it still doesn't generate Verilog, and the only reason i haven't done that now still i keep deferring it uh is because i want to figure out what the api looks like for um for generating memory um for for specifying that you want like a block block RAM or something, uh, which I think I'm gonna essentially just steal the chisel API for that. So I think that'll work just fine. And also I wanted to work on like the if syntactic sugar cause I wasn't really happy with the macro based thing that we worked on a few weeks ago. So I'll go over what I came up with for that uh, and why I changed it. Um, but the other major thing that I did is I actually was able to port the Xenoing CPU already. So this is now I, man, I did a lot of stuff, I guess. <laughs> so I totally changed the directory structure. Um, so if we, I don't know if you guys can even see this tiny font, but I took all the RTL that was in here before and I put it in this RTL old directory. I got rid of basically all the simulator stuff. Um, a lot of the code's still there because I'm going to need to reference some of this when hooking up like the DDR3 tests and stuff, but um, <clears throat> it's all not hooked up anymore. Um, in the make file, I cleared everything out uh, except for generating the rtl stuff with the old kaze because i'm still using that in some of the tests uh which i'm going to replace um but i also added a bunch of stuff so one of the things that i added most recently i think i mentioned that i uh got the the cpu ported and the code is is fairly nice it's like 500 lines and you have a whole cpu which is pretty sick and a lot of this also is just convenient stuff like all the stuff at the top is just unpacking instructions um, and yeah, I don't think it's quite done yet, but it, it is also a lot simpler because once I had this API like this, uh, I was able to iterate on it and, and, um, for conditionals, I had this thing where you would make like a signal mutable and then there would be this if syntax and it could kind of overwrite it. So it's very similar to like the two process style in Verilog. Uh, but I decided instead to change to this more functional approach where for an if, uh, instead of using macros, it's a function which returns like an if object and you can give it a conditional and then actually let me find a smaller example of this. Here's a really good one. Uh, and this is a good example for a couple reasons. The main one being that it returns two signals. So you call if and you give it a condition and then you give it, uh, here I make a scope, but that's also just kind of for form. This could also just be any kind of, um, expression. Uh, but here I return, um, in this case, this uh, uh, tuple of two signals. And so then the idea is that this will return this if this condition is true. Um, and then that's just an if object, which isn't a signal. And one of the things that I want to enforce here is that every if actually has an else when you use this functional style like this. Um, so for the else, uh, it returns, um, yeah, you do dot else and then you give it like another object. And in this case, the tuple sizes here have to match. Uh, but when they do, then this will actually return a signal. Um, and it will essentially r return, like, it, it unpacks the tuples, and then for each position in the tuple, it, it returns mux, uh, where this is the condition, and then this is the true case, and this is the false case. Um, so, I mean, this is this is really straightforward if you guys have ever used any functional languages or even Rust when you're using if as a as a statement, or I mean as, a, as an expression. Uh, if you want it to return multiple values, you wrap them up in a tuple like this. Um, and I like that approach better because it, it ends up being more um, composable with other Rust constructs. Like this, I think is a fairly natural way to write these. 
And it had another funny advantage, which is when I, I rewrote the whole CPU like this, there were a couple conditionals that I had that returned, like this one actually returned several different signals. And usually when you see this, that's kind of a sign that maybe you're doing too much in that kind of conditional. So um, I was able to simplify, I don't really have an example off the top of my head now, but I was in a couple of cases I was able to sort of use that as like a litmus test to see like, can I actually simplify this? And in a lot of cases I could. And it also helped me find a couple bugs, which was really cool. So I was a bit surprised, pleasantly surprised with that. And it's it's funny too, because this was actually the original kind of version of this construct that I had thought of. Um, but I thought this would be really verbose and ugly. But at the same time, it is kind of verbose and ugly, but it also reads as good as we can make it read with just functions like this. And then it's not magic and it behaves in a really expected way. So I'm actually really happy with this approach. And I think I'm gonna do the same thing for like matching. Um, which is nice. And the other thing is that this is all part of the Kaze API. So if you, like right now I just have if and else, but of course if I had said use Kaze, not Kaze star, then I would have to prefix that with Kaze. And then then it's kind of nice that it's Kaze if, uh, which for some people I think they would appreciate that kind of clarity in their code. Um, anyway, so that's really cool. And then most recently I did something awesome. So Daniel Collin in the chat, uh, shout outs to him because, uh, he had recently been working on an emulator project with risk involving risk five and had actually integrated the, uh, the compliance test suite, uh, or was able to run the compliance suite against his emulator. And <clears throat> he was also extra helpful in showing me how that worked. Uh, and I realized it was a lot simpler to set up than I had kind of feared. So let me... Uh, let me pull up the compliance suite and then I'll show you guys what I've done with it. So this is the risk five compliance repo. I'm going to link that. And when looking at this, it, it doesn't actually look that daunting, but I kind of bounced off it a couple times thinking, ah, oh, this is going to be a pain to set up, but actually it's really easy. Um, if you just look at the readme, uh, there's this running the compliance test. So if you clone this repo just as is, and it even tells you like the one thing you're probably going to need. So if you run make uh, and then with this risk five prefix variable, and then this is the prefix for all of your risk five cross compiler tools, um, then it just it just works. It run it um, it will go and build all of the tests which are in this in a given suite. I think you also need to specify the uh, device, but then this default target, for example, uh, is this OVP sim, and this actually ships in this repo with um, with with binaries pre built binaries. And so this will actually build all the examples in the suite uh, and then run it in that sim and then give you the results, which is really nice. Uh, so out of the box, that basically works. And then the way you extend this, which is actually isn't the way that, that Daniel did it, but um, uh, he did it a simpler way that was better for his project. But I wanted to kind of try it the, I guess, the proper way. And I'm actually really happy with what I came up with. So I moved a couple things around and I'll show you guys where I'm at now. So first of all, on GitHub, I moved the Xenowing project into its own group or organization, I think it's called in GitHub. And the only reason I did this is because now we have multiple repos here. So there's the Xenowing repo and then there's the RISC-V compliance repo, which is, which is a fork of the main repo, which is, if we look at the uh, fork thing here, we can see it like everyone does this. So this is kind of what you're supposed to do. Uh, so you fork this repo. And then you add, let's see, is this the best way to, to do a compare? Screw it, we'll do it anyway. Um, you add a, essentially what, whatever files are necessary to describe your specific device and how to build the test for your device. And so you basically just copy some files from the other devices and then make whatever changes you have to make. Um, and I think what I ended up specifying was in this target thing. So now there's Marv. I don't even know if I mentioned Marv, by the way, small aside. Marv is, <clears throat> yeah, apparently Xenowing is written in cock. I'd love it to be provably correct, but that's definitely not what I've done. Um, so Marv, I've decided is the new name for my CPU. And I might've mentioned this before, but Marv is, is actually an acronym. So it stands for Mostly Adequate Risk v And that's just, I think, really fitting for this project. I think I, I mentioned this a while ago that I wanted to give the different... Um, 
the different units in the project. I guess more silly names like that. And this is what I came up with for the CPU. So in here, there's these this compliance test thing, which which has macros for for saying like what a halt looks like at the end of the test, uh, what the what the code before the test and after the test is going to look like, uh, and then this I/O thing, which um, there's some stuff like uh, write a string that the test might call. There's things like assert that a, a general purpose register is equal to some value. So it's those kind of things that the tests the tests often are decorated with. And then you can either define these as nothing, or you can define those as stuff that'll like produce output in your given simulator or whatever the environment is. So uh, I think that's actually broken for the test right now. And I, that's what I want to fix sort of right away, but that's basically it. And then beyond that, it's just literally a linker script and a make file. Um, and linker script mostly matches what I already had at the ROM for the repo, which is actually, I think, overkill for this purpose, because in this own, in this simulator environment, I could, I don't have to match the whole Xeno because it's not running on the entire system. I'm only t testing the CPU in isolation. So um, all the memory mapping and stuff is synthetic anyway. So I might as well simplify that. But for now, I did what I what was uh, uh, the most familiar to me. And then, yeah, the make file is literally this short. And I think I just took one of the ones for the other simulators and just modified it. So all in all, it was a really easy experience to get this up and running. And now if I wrong window... If I go to this one, uh, the Xenowing repo, and I do make test. In fact, actually, I'll do this really quick. Oh. Hit control C, and now things seem super dead. Close anyway. <laughs> do it in this other window. Make clean. And then if I do make test, uh, this will build the RTL, uh, which is now written in Kaze. It will build a simulator that wraps that in another project, and it will build all of the compliance tests and run them against that simulator, which is so cool. So I'm really pumped about that because uh, there actually turns out there was only one bug in my, in my CPU implementation, which is I'm extremely surprised about, and I'll share what that is shortly. Although the test actually did do a couple weird things, I noticed there was one test um, that, uh, what did it do? There was one test that just wrote over the program uh, code, which is kind of weird, but that's totally what the what the code is doing, um, which my simulator originally caught as an error. And then there's another test uh, that read a little bit outside of the of the memory area for where it stores the results. Um, so when I fixed those issues in the simulator, or at least allowed those things to happen because before they were, they were being caught as out of bounds errors, uh, then all the tests ran. And then I was able to figure out it's basically all just shifts that were wrong. And what I had done is in the risk five encoding here, I'm not going to go too deep into the detail here, but the idea is that you have these, um, shift left shift right all these shifts and in particular these immediate ones were the ones that were wrong and what i had done was uh for actually are these, are these all the shifts yeah it's just these three so here if you, if you look at this table uh this field is rs1 so like that's the register select one this is rs2 and because this says shift amount here I, I had actually assumed that you would take this field directly and use that as the shift amount, which is not the case. Uh, if you look at the test code, it's it's quite clear that they take the value of this register instead. So it actually reduces logic the way that they have it set up because then you just, the right-hand side uh, going into the ALU is always uh, the actual value register too. Um, except in the cases where it's immediate, but then that's the whole, whole conditional. So I think in the MARV code, it looks like um i think it's just this one up here which i which i was talking about earlier so in this case if uh this bit three is set then it's a register computation uh and then the right hand side of the to the alu is going to be this and then there's this op modifier which is going to be unchanged otherwise it's going to use this immediate as the right hand side and then depending on uh there is actually some special case handling required for shift here uh, which basically determines whether or not this 30 bit is used to modify the ALU up. And for all of the immediate ones, uh, or all of the register computation things, 
I think. Or no, it was all the ones that are coded like this. So they're all encoded as immediates. For all of these, this upper bit is part of this immediate. So you don't want to use that. But then for this one instruction, SRAI, you actually do want it to respect that. Um, and then this, yeah, the logical shift right also needs that. Something like that. Anyway, uh, so there's a little bit of logic there, but that's it. So this is kind of the whole thing. So the whole fix was was that, whereas before I had it when it was a shift, uh, instead of having reg two here, it would do RS2. So really easy fix. I'm glad you guys like the name. By the way, hi to guys in the chat. <laughs> Daniel Cullen, Alcama. Thank you again for the sub, Alcama. Um, Chief Detector, Lord DeCapo, Dark Second. Good to see you guys. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's really nice. Now we actually have some. Now we can actually trust uh, the CPU a little bit, which is a welcome change. Did my video freeze for you guys? By the way, seems that it's acting strange on my end, but that might just be something else. Yeah, I've been quite busy. Uh, so the other things that I've been doing is um, is figuring out where to go next with this because i was thinking about porting all of like the the um like the system bus and everything but i i actually think since i want to implement a dma anyway it's kind of a good opportunity to revisit all of that logic and i had drawn a picture in one of my notebooks about it but i hadn't actually made it communicatable uh, on the stream so i think i think i'm gonna just build all that stuff from scratch uh, which i don't think will be that bad because now that we have uh that we have this cause tool, it's really easy to bring uh, a given piece of RTL up to Rust to run it, uh, run tests against it that are written in Rust. Um, and I think that's going to be really valuable when writing. Then I can I can very easily make targeted tests against like just the system bus, so I can test the memory mapping and everything um, against entirely mocked objects, which I think is going to be a really good idea for a bus because uh, the logic in there. It seems straightforward because most it should just be memory mapping, but because it's asynchronous, then there's a bit of handling for like it's it's asynchronous, and there's a couple part of it parts of it they're gonna have like multiple masters, and you need to know like oh a, a read is gonna come back, then we need to know which master sent that read, for example. Um, so there's a lot of those kind of issues that we want to deal with. Um, so there ends up being a little bit of state in there, um, and then a lot of like memory mapping, and I think that's a really good case for targeted testing. So I want to do that. Yeah, totally. I think I think that I think DMA is going to be a really good choice for the system. That was another thing I spoke with Daniel Collin about a, a couple of months ago. Um, and it seems that I'm ending up in a design that's uh, that's pretty similar to the PS2, which I'm quite happy with. Um, but it's mostly to work around these DDR3 latencies, which is nice. <laughs> nice to be able to come up with solutions that are effective and I guess reminiscent of existing solutions for successful commercial products anyway i think the next thing i still wanted to do was um in the tests here you can see when i run them uh this is it running all the tests so basically the fact that it says test complete and then success uh this is really good so when it runs the tests it produces these these signature output files and the whole idea there is that there are just these these hex dumps of a certain memory region that the test will write all the results into and then at the end here it checks those against some reference files that are in the repo and you can see there are four of these that are ignored and that's because i actually removed those from from the list of tests but then the references are still there and this is ecall and ebreak which i'm not supporting in my implementation right now and also these misaligned jumps and misaligned load stores uh, so those are the four that don't actually run um because again, I've, I'm not supporting those. Like the misalign stuff, you can do, uh, there's a compiler flag, uh, it's called dash M strict align. And that is meant for machine level code. Uh, I think, think it's called machine level or machine mode. I don't know, the lowest software level in RISC-V. Um, it's for code like that, where the hardware won't explicitly uh, support misalign load in stores. And you can't guarantee at that level that, that traps are gonna be available. So I'm kind of taking advantage of the fact that that's there and just not going to support any of this stuff because misaligned jump, I think, is supposed to raise a trap. Uh, misaligned load store is supposed to raise a trap, but then you're normally supposed to handle that trap gracefully and actually implement the load store, or you're supposed to uh, actually implement the misaligned loads and stores and hardware. And I, 
I would like to do neither. Um, and then, yeah, e-break and e-call are also just ways to raise. Uh, these are basically syscalls. Um, and since I'm running the ROM, I know these are never going to come up. So I think I think we're quite okay to just ignore those, even though that, that technically makes the, uh, the CPU non-compliant. But that's why it's called mostly adequate risk five. <laughs> so I'm pretty happy with that. The other thing too is that the current implementation, I think I mentioned this before, it's it still is a pipeline CPU, but it doesn't actually run the pipeline stages in parallel. There's some control logic that just gates each one in, in turn. Um, and I'm actually thinking that I might want to support interrupts. I was thinking for a long time that I wouldn't, but I've been thinking more and more about how I want to interact with the system, especially when developing stuff. And I think it might be a really good idea to be able to have the system be able to um, accept input input from the PC. So right now I can send stuff over the UART and in the in the most recent build of the Xenowing, uh, what that would do is it would initiate a ROM reload. So you would send a four byte length of the new ROM file and then you would do that. And then there'd be hardware on the other end that they would take that and then start replacing the program ROM and then reset the system. And I think actually I wanna have, instead of that always happening, I wanna have um, some kind of trap so that whenever whenever a byte is sent to to the UART. <laughs> That's great, marvelous, I love that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, then, then I could, I could get a trap whenever there's a byte sent and then I could use that to handle something. And the nice part about that is that I would be able to essentially have like whatever kind of protocol I want between the, the system and the host. And then it's two ways, which means if I wanted to, for example, implement really basic, a, a basic way to read a file from my host PC, that's actually probably a really good idea when testing stuff. It's not going to be very fast because it's like 40, 40 K a second or something of bandwidth, but for, for small textures and stuff, I think that would be really reasonable. Um, and I think that would be a much better, uh, experience than always putting stuff in ROM because, um, that can take a while to reload anyway, but we'll see. That's just an idea I'm playing with. But the nice part about the current implementation of the CPU is that it would be really natural to implement that because I can just have a, an interrupt, uh, line that comes into the CPU, and then whenever that's high, before we issue another instruction, we could instead have logic that goes to uh, an interrupt handler. So, I think that would be really, really straightforward. And if I implement that stuff, then I might actually implement uh, traps for for jump and uh, misaligned jumps and misaligned load stores. Because why not? In fact, all these might make sense to implement. Then, basically, the only reason I don't have these is because I don't have any kind of traps or exceptions. So, if I decide to implement them, then that might make sense. I think, no, the branch should be okay uh, because because as long as when I accept, I store what the next PC is going to be in an internal register, then then we can recover regardless of what the instruction was. Dark second, yeah, I do plan to do a vector unit. <laughs> that would be cool too, Curbs. Um, I think if I did that, I would want to do uh, the video chip in the C64. But for for the for the GPU and the Xenowing, I do plan on going that and going into that in pretty great detail, um, depending on what I end up with. So, at the very least, I want to do that. But yeah, this is the base Risk Five instruction set. It's really minimal, and that's one of the reasons I chose to implement this architecture in the first place is because I didn't really want to do like a compiler. So like, I think it's I still maintain that it's easier if you just want to do your own uh, your own CPU design. You can design something that's really easy to implement in hardware, and then you either have to write everything in assembler or you have to write a C compiler. And neither one of those sounded very appealing because I knew I wanted to make a rasterizer and stuff. So I thought I really wanted C and I do enough other compiler work that I thought I could skip this one. So uh, I chose Risk Five uh, because I knew I could just implement the small subset and then get away with it. Because you literally just tell the compiler to only emit code for this this base set of instructions and it will do that. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, as Daniel Collin points out, there's also a, a lot of extensions um, which you you can choose to implement or not. So in this case, there's like no multiply divide or float stuff. Um, which I might add at some point, but who knows. Uh, 
Uh, Lord De Capo, I don't think there are status flags in Risk Five. I think I think it just stores all the results to registers. So in that case, I would still perform the normal write back uh, that the instruction specified, except the PC would go somewhere else, and I'd route the PC to a return register, and I would also write back state that we're going to enter an interrupt, and then I think that's it. Then as long as I have a way to exit the interrupt. For example, by using one of these e-call or e-break or whatever, which I think one of these probably does something like that, then I think it should work. So I think think it would actually be really easy. Yeah, no worries, Lord Capo. Happy to discuss it and double check, so I'm happy you're bringing it up. But I'm pretty sure that's it's quite easy with Risk Five. Yeah, modern GPU, that, that would be cool to to kind of dig into that stuff. But at least at least this really low like architectural level, architectural level detail, uh, I'm not as familiar with. So for modern GPUs, but that'd be fun to dig into. Make like a some kind of high level simulator for that stuff and simulate some some workloads and like how a schedule how, how scheduler might work. That's probably something I'd want to do at some point anyway. So that might be cool. <laughs> I know what you mean, Lord Decapo. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Um, but yeah, so what I want to do is this compliance IO for the Marv thing. Uh, I have this RV test IO quiet, and I literally took this from the compliance IO for this this uh, OVP sim. Uh, mostly just copied over the code, basically verbatim, and made some small changes. Now, when I when I comment this out, because if normally when this is defined, we have all these macros um, that end up doing nothing. And if I don't have this defined, then we'll get. Um, Mainly this write GPR thing and this uh, write string thing, and then there's also this uh, assert GP, uh, GPR thing. And I think the main part here is actually well. I'll, I'll show you what happens when I run the tests. Uh, it's kind of funny. Let me bump this up. So I'll run this. My video will freeze a little bit while I compile Rust. Okay, and then, so if we look at some of this stuff, I get index out of bounds somewhere. That doesn't seem too bad, but I'm not sure what that is. And then there's also, yeah, nothing too bad, except here we get some garbage symbols that the tests seem to have written out. And I'm not entirely sure why this is the case. So that's what I want to debug. Um, so if I if I just let's say I just comment out all of this stuff, I'm assuming comments are taken out by the lexer before it starts um, expanding macros. So if I did this, let's see if that works. Okay, so already that breaks. So at least we can isolate this because again, I copied this code more or less verbatim. Now the only real difference is that in that other simulator, um, there's this put C thing, and there's just writes to register, whereas or like a uh, it uses an undefined instruction um, to to write out a character, and in in my case, I write to a specific address, and then the simulator is just set up to listen for writes at that address. Um, so the only difference between that is that I actually have to clobber a register when I do that, um, which is going to be the address of of this so we need to load um load a register with with this uh io address and then we need to store a byte there and the byte can basically be anything um which which we get as input here so that's what i do for io and that's that's the one basically the one difference but it seems that even write string already has some issues so i might be clobbering the wrong register i might be i don't actually know so I want to dig more into this code. When I originally copied it over, I was being a bit sloppy because uh, basically nothing worked. So I think that I might have some 
just dumb things that I did here. So we, I want to take a look at that. Anyway, uh, for any given test, I guess we can just pick one. It's probably easier to, to just run one. So where's that? I'm gonna pull up the RISC-V compliance repo again because they had, let's see, there was in suite, I think, or no, it was in this mic file. You can specify a given test, and I think you did it with risk five underscore test. I don't remember which one this was in. Or I thought it was actually listed down here. This help thing, yeah, risk five test, and then you would do any given one. So let's just copy that so that we can make test and run with that same thing. I think it just works. So now it should just run the add test, for example. And here it also got that index out of bounds panic, which is not what we want to see. Uh, so then if I, just for another litmus test here, if I disable that, then add runs with no issues. Uh, we get test complete here. So that's what we want to fix. Now, if we look at this particular test, this was again, test add, wasn't it? Yeah, I add one. And then if we go into, uh, test or so compliance, uh, in the suite, are we 32? I there's add a one here. I'm also just going to close a bunch of other stuff. And again, just to be sure I ran add and not add I, and I did. So this, this test basically looks like this. You have this code begin, and then eventually you'll have this code end. And there's the actual test code emits a bunch of um, other macros. And so normally we can just define these to do nothing. So again, I can take, like I think I just took out the GPR equals one like this, and I can do the same here for write string. We can start with that. If I do that, I also expect this would work, and it, it does. And in fact, we see that it ran and the result was good. So it's definitely something in this code. So now we know if we look at this, like the first thing this does is just try to write the string. So let's just get it to try and write out test begin. Now, initially, I actually implemented this myself without trying to copy the code from the other simulator, and it just worked, which is nice. Uh, but then the other simulator had all this code for doing this GPR assertion stuff. So I would like to have that. So I would like to, I think, still massage this code. Um, but we can take a look. Hey, Fenrog, thanks for the sub. <laughs> Man, you guys, you guys have the best emotes today. <laughs> That's so great. By the way, unrelated, one of these streams, I'm so excited to talk about buses. <laughs> I've thought way too much about buses lately. But long story short, I'm taking ideas from AXI, Wishbone, and what was it called? Avalon, and making my own bus. Which is going to work, because I know it did work in the old design, but it's going to be a little more formal how I approach it. Mainly like Avalon, it's going to have like byte enables and stuff uh, and no uh, return paths to see that like a transaction had a success or failure. We're just going to assume that they're always successful. And that's again, just to simplify things. Um, but then it's going to, I guess, look more like AXI Lite. I think, I don't know. I ended up a design that, that I'm happy with and we'll implement it soon. Yeah, Dark Second figured it out. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna have that really that ready valid handshaking exactly. So it should be it should be really basic, but I'll go over the my thoughts in more detail at some point. Like, I think it would have been nice to have AXI Lite, but they, they have those return paths, which is weird. But I actually, the weirdest part is that they have different um, 
buses with different ready and valid handshaking for uh, for the address and the data of a ride, for example. You you actually issue those separately, which which I don't like. Not for this system, at least. So, And then I thought, well, why don't I just implement that anyway? Like, all the slaves can still do that, and then um, can still be implemented that way. And then I can hook it up to something else later. But then I thought, well, if I implement it the way I'm thinking anyway, I can then add a small wrapper that will export that interface. And the, the biggest reason why I don't want to just deal with that interface and implement it anyway is because then the master needs to have a bunch of handling for for um for example cases where the both cases where the transaction failed but also splitting up those those like reads and writes into different buses for the for the data and address which timing wise i don't want to do that Yeah, exactly, Lord Decay, but that's, that's where I'm going to end up with. It's just kind of the, the simple and obvious thing, I think. <laughs> um, but that's basically why I'm not just going to take AXI Lite, is because it had those kind of oddities. So in that, in that sense, it's going to be more like Avalon, but in terms of like the signal names and making it formal, I guess it's closer to Axie. I'm not sure. Kind of just talking out of my ass here, <laughs> but I'm excited to implement that stuff. And again, I'm, I'm really excited to have tests for that stuff because like now we've kind of verified that the CPU mostly does what it, what we expect it to do. Um, and then we'll have a separate val se separate uh, verification for, for the buses, which I think is going to be smart. And then most of the peripherals I'm, I'm not going to test in isolation because some of them are going to be so obvious. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so just looking at this right string, so the first thing it does is this, this push, and the last thing it does is this pop. And so the idea behind this code, and again, I didn't really write this, so I might say something wrong here, but um, the basic idea is that there's some begin reg state variable somewhere. And this is in, this ends up in the data section. I'm not actually sure where this is defined. I think it's defined in, um, in uh, where is it? The compliance thing, there should be target. And then for my device, which is Marv, I think it's in this test thing. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's in one of the other ones, like env, I think it is. And then you have risk five test. Yeah, it's here. So there's a bunch of, there's this whole area in memory. Oh yeah, this is the RV, RV test data end. And here uh, it just gives you this, this chunk of memory where you're you're meant to save and restore register state. So that's literally what this does is before it does anything, it just pushes and pops state from, from that area. Now, the one thing it needs to do to do that is load the address of that area before it can actually do any, any stores there, uh, stores or loads. So it takes in this SP, which is going to be a volatile register. Um, and that's just any register you can clobber. So I figured since the code for that other system was doing this, that I could more or less just follow that same pattern and take whatever register it would give me here, which seems to be, I think actually the tests will specify that always, which is nice. Uh, but it always, pretty much is always x31. I don't think I've seen anything else in these tests. Um, but yeah, so that's why there's that argument. And then str in this case is the string. And so the first thing it does is it changes sections. Uh, so we go into a data section and then we store the actual string data and then we go into the this text in it thing and you know what i actually think i just solved it in my head <laughs> i hope it's not this simple but it might be i'm not actually sure that i'm no this dot data star should should include that shouldn't it that data dot string in fact i can I can do this. We can pull up OBJ num and just make sure the string is there. That'd be good enough for me. Uh, so risk five OBJ dump. Um, actually, let's just open the the binary in a hex editor. It's even easier because I can't remember the flags to uh, to dump the data section. You know, it's funny, the, the I learned to use all these bin utils 
um, because of all the Virtual Boy stuff. And I hadn't hadn't done it before that, which I think is funny. That's also another thing I I, I might consider is making a, a like code generator for testing the Xenowing CPU or something, like I did for the Virtual Boy. That was really fun. Um. Anyway, we want to look into tests, risk five compliance. Uh, I think they all end up in work. And so we can take add.elf.bin and that should, that should be it. I don't see the string in here. Okay, that might actually be the issue, you guys. It might be that simple. I knew I had it working before, and that was probably before I added all this extra stuff in the make file to uh, copy data sections and everything, which the test eventually needed. Maybe that's maybe that's the issue. That would definitely explain it because I did find it a little strange that writing strings failed because this code is is ridiculously simple. Uh, just to walk through it, it it adds this like little local label and stores the string in there, and then switches sections back to this this text section, and then it gets an address an address to that string. Uh, and then jumps to this write stir function, which I think it does this move here. Don't really know why it does that. I think it just uses A0 to pass stuff. So it moves that address of the string into T0 and then uses A0 as the character. So it loads the byte um, without a sign extension, like that matters. I guess, I guess you would want that because uh, that way you occupy the whole 32 bits. Uh, it clears all the other bits. Uh, because then I think what it does is it adds, oh no, it increments the pointer. That's what it does here. So we load the byte and then increment the pointer. And then we check if A is zero. So we check it against a zero reg. And if that's the case, then we're gonna jump forward. And otherwise we're gonna do put C and then jump back. So this code is really simple. And then put C again is uh, load T1 with the serial register or this, this address of the serial port and then just store the byte. So very, very basic. And yeah, the fact that we can't see that string is kind of surprising, but it kind of makes sense because I think I don't have any special handling for, uh, for that kind of section in the, in the linker script. So again, this was dot data dot string. Now I thought that having dot data star here would be enough. But I think the, if we look at, for example, um, this default linker script, this actually puts stuff in another section here, dot data dot string. I just wanna make sure actually I'm not sure I actually built that, but now this should be. Okay, actually this isn't here. Yeah, that makes more sense because I thought that this dot data star would catch that and I think it does. And you can see it's at the end too, which is sensible here. So, okay, so those strings are actually in there, which that, that would have been a nice, easy fix, but it does actually make sense that it's already there. So then what could actually be going wrong here? So let's just comment out, or actually just remove all this stuff. So it's just pushing and popping, and then, then what breaks? Nothing breaks, and in fact, if we run all the tests, hopefully we see nothing breaks. Hmm. By the way, you, you probably notice there's a big block in one of these tests where it says writing to the program ROM. And again, this is that the AUIPC test that ends up doing that. And the nice part is it prints out the address. This is again from my simulator. It prints out the addresses where it tried to do that. And this is the only test that ends up doing this. So we can see that from this output. And we can also see the addresses where it did that. And if I open up this test in the, in the disassembler, you'll see that that matches, um, which is still good validation. Okay, so then that works, but of course it doesn't do anything. So, 
two things. Actually, another thing I just thought of is, is this actually the right address for what I for where I made this right in this emulator? I'll go ahead and double check that. It should be because I think this will just crash on other addresses. Um, but just to be sure. So we look in sim, the Marv main, it's in here. Oh, by the way, two things. I'm missing some features in uh, Kaze still. So in particular shifts. Uh, and also sub so actually the alu has been pulled out into rust code for the for the time being which is uh on one hand it means that the, not the whole cpu is in the rtl yet um which is fine like these features aren't aren't going to be that hard to implement i just haven't done it yet but it's also a good uh a good test case to show that this is possible and in this case the way that that works is uh for every cycle we set whatever signals that we know are going to be whatever they need to be we propagate them through through the sim and then we, in this case, I say like the ALU res, and then we run through the ALU here. And then I also, the, the register file is also separate. So we we take the outputs from the Marv and then run them through whatever our stuff is and then put them back into the inputs. Then we propagate again. And then that's it. And then later we take the clock and do whatever. So it's, it's pretty easy to hook up, which is nice. So here, yeah, okay. So this, this two many zeros is this test complete registers. This is what happens at the end of the test. It will just write to here. And then this simulator just interprets that as it being done. So in this 21 number here, this is the serial, right? So this, this is where it actually outputs the data. So this is the correct address. So I wanted to check there. Um, but yeah, so we had, where was it? do undo yeah there it goes down here so let's say we just do this this should run too if this doesn't then that's already an issue oh okay so that actually already broke it and i don't know why <laughs> it might be that these are these text sections don't match up I don't think that's going to be the issue. It might also be actually, no, because we tested that the push and pop works on its own. So I'm going to trust that. So what's this there? Yeah. Text in it. Is that what I use here? So for compliance IO or is it compliance test? So in here, section dot text dot init. That's where this code goes. There's text stub and text in it. And in the linker script, we take dot entry. No text dot stub, that should be. Or maybe not. Wait, I think I think I did have this right actually, because entry and then dot text star right. Still the same issue, but I think it is more correct to have that star there. Anyway, yeah, dot entry. It seems to we actually that is what we want. Oh yeah, there is another section entry here that we want at the very beginning. That is true. And then that needs to be at the very beginning of ROM because that's where it's going to enter. And then it jumps to the stub. That's where text.stub is. That's fine. And then text.init, I think, is where all the test code goes. I actually want this to just be text. And then this can just go back into the text section, which I think is more natural. Again, same error, which is fine, I guess. Um, but what what are we actually doing now? Nothing. We're just this is the code we removed. So again, if I just do this, then it works. If I do all this, then it doesn't. Very strange. 
Um, I think also this isn't being, or maybe it is, I'm not sure. Let's try removing this and this. So we just switch sections and then that should maybe work. Test complete. Dark second, uh, that's for uh, getting the address of that string. Because this string uh, in the macro form is just the literal. And so what we do is we open up the, or we go to the data section and then we make a label and then we dump that string. And then we refer to the address of that by this label. Actually, is LA correct here? Might be LI actually. I think this is this is the correct instruction for that. So it's just a label and then it's just like a number. In fact, I'll, I'll stick with one th or 10,000, whatever. And then this B here means that we want the, uh, this one. So that should, I still don't know why that doesn't work, but it doesn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think what we just saw is that if I just have this, whoops, if I take everything out except that switching, then it works. And in fact, I could do this too. And that worked. Interesting. But does this not work? Okay, no, that does work. That makes probably more sense. So when we switch sections, that works. And when we have um, just push and pop, that works. And as soon as we stuff this string in there, it doesn't work, which is strange. But I actually wonder. Let's actually run this too with rust back traces one. And then we might even see where this is coming from. Fortunately, we don't because it's all inline and crap. <laughs> all right, maybe I can run this in debug and the easiest way to do that is go into the make file no not that one that one and I'm gonna search release and I think if we if we remove these that works and then I think we can go into this make file here Debug or dev, I can never remember. Yeah, there might be something to that, Dark Second. In fact, y you might be onto that. I Because th I think I actually always read whole words from the program ROM. That's probably what it is, actually. In fact, here we got... Yeah, we were indexing evacuate. It was at 105 in main RS. I actually think you're spot on. I think that's going to be exactly what it does. So if you go into here, main.rs, 105, we'll see that is where it's writing the program ROM. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. So this ROM is currently not padded to uh to always be words aha so then what's the best way for me to do that probably just pad it in the simulator it's probably the easiest by the way i'm gonna oh so many windows
I got this make file, and then I'm also gonna get that other make file. Not here, not here. This one. Switch that back. I think that's exactly what, what the problem is. And maybe that's the whole issue all along. <laughs> maybe the real friends or the real error was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> he says with zero confidence. Okay, so the program ROM here, I just use FS read. Let's do this then. What up? <laughs> all right, there it is. Yeah, that's definitely what it was. So let's go ahead and run all of them again. And just to see that this does indeed work for all tests. That would make sense. And then it makes sense why as soon as we add the string that would happen without actually doing any code. Or it, or it must be still printing it now because no, it's not yet. I'm actually not sure why that's an error. <laughs> yeah, twist debug stuff. All my streams are twist debug stuff streams. It's awesome. Um, I'm actually surprised that that was an error because it would have had to read that data. I don't know why it would be doing that. I mean, it, it was this code, this line here, but what was reading this? I mean, any anything that could have set that bus adder there would have done it. Oh, I know what, what, it, what it would have been in the, what it, what it, what it would have been. Um, I know what it is. It's in this original test code. It copies all of the data section into RAM first. And it's probably this copy that broke it. That's my guess. Uh, I think, yeah, this does it a word at a time. So this is the code that does that. That makes sense. Okay, then I'm gonna add a comment for this. In fact, I guess arguably, The linker scripts would probably do this. No, I didn't re-enable the printing. I'm thinking actually that the string data should should be padded somehow. Because I think in here, yeah, we have data end and data start. And then this code will just Copy until we hit data end. That's yeah, this one, as long as this is less than this. Oh well. You know, I actually think, I actually think I wanna do this in the, in this code. And the reason is, um, BSS should do the same.
the reason is that I think it's nice to to be able to get as much extra error checking as we can. And like this is this would have technically been been an error because it is the program reading beyond its bounds. So I actually feel like this is a better solution. But it wasn't sufficient apparently. <laughs> Why would that be? Oh, I know why. Because these these reads and writes are still okay. We actually screw this. <laughs> uh, that was good thinking, but I actually. Whoops. Because that code, even though it was going to be reading and writing bytes, that still is interpreted on the bus as whole word transfers in the, the way the simulator works right now. Um, so even though the code said to read a byte, it's implemented in this simulator as still reading all those, is reading the whole word. So I think, yeah. Granted, uh, all of the other bytes other than the f other than like the ones up to the natural read size are undefined in terms of returning the data, so I could also fix it here. But in that case, then it would break unless I also had the linker script changed, or I mean this startup script changed. Maybe that is actually also what I want to do. <laughs> Let's kind of do both here. Yeah, this is kind of the longer way to do it, but it feels cleaner to me to kind of fix both issues like this. Um, I'm going to go back on this one more time. <laughs> And that is because I actually have no way of knowing uh, for reads what the size is going to be. Um, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, the, the CPU does produce a byte enable signal for writes, but not for reads. And I think it's just extra work to have it do generate that for both when we only ever need it for writes. Yeah. There are strobe registers where you'd want to have like a read to those only touch whatever the bytes that it's actually going to do. But I think I'm going to align all the, all the system registers to two words. So I don't think that would ever be an issue. In fact, I think I'm going to align all of them to 16 byte boundaries, which is going to seem a little wonky to have them that far apart when the CPU can only read 32 bit words, but ultimately I'm going to have a six, uh, 128 bit wide bus um, to support the DMA. And then I think having everything on the system bus aligned to uh, 16 byte boundaries or under 20 bit, 28 bit boundaries is going to be the most natural thing. And plus the, all the addresses are going to read really nice in the readme that way, because they're all going to be just, just a, a digit over shifted hexadecimal, but then they're all going to be, uh, like a line to one on that digit. So it's going to be, it's going to read nice. Anyway, this is a good fix. <laughs> Long story short. So now if we do this, maybe it just works. Or maybe not. We don't know yet. Oh, look at that. So printing works now, which is really cool. That's exciting. And the output isn't isn't terribly exciting. I mean, it just says like test number or whatever, but it's still, I think it's useful to have this output. And in fact, I'm going to have it be verbose like this by default because it's also just extra checking. Um, because if this, if this did anything weird and it would crash or if it, if it, uh, 
broke the result, then that's, again, it's just extra testing. So I feel like it's a good idea. Even though it tests the same code over and over again, it's harder to debug. To debug, we can just disable it when we were debugging, which is what I've done previously. Uh, so that's great. And then, uh, yeah, then I just want to try this. Just see if it, maybe it just works. Nope. <laughs> Did not work. Fabrication truncated a fit. That's a bit concerning. Which test was this? This is the endianness test. So probably any of the tests. I think that's the first one that builds. Uh, this might just be me having done something stupid. I don't know yet. Hope it's nothing with reusing these labels. It might be actually, in fact, that's probably what it is because here we do 1000, but then this macro is then invoked via this one, which is invoked here. And so then this 1000B should go here, but then when this one goes to, this one goes to 1000F, which probably just jumps here. That seems wrong to me. So let's go ahead and bump this up. Maybe that just works. There we go. Oh, seems some of these are still breaking. Yeah, I attempted to read a write to unmapped address. So there's more stuff to debug here. But let's just pick one of these uh, to iterate on this fairly quickly. So what's this one up here? IRF size, let's go with that. Actually, does the add one still do that? Because I already have that open. Bang, yeah, that one already breaks, so that's great. So we'll do the same thing here where I'm just gonna um, just gonna take a bunch of this out. So if we just grab all this stuff, for example, then what happens? Nothing bad. So we'll run the whole suite again, just to be sure, but pretty sure that just works. I think this is so worth our time because like debugging this kind of stuff is going to be a pain in the ass in context of the system. So, and again, these tests were a lot easier to set up than I, than I had realized. So I'm really happy about that. I'm so tempted by the way, to make more dad jokes now that I just saw that, uh, that emoji. or emote as they're called on Twitch. It's pretty great. Okay, so let's let's just try this and I wonder actually if one of the assertions is failing and maybe that's why this breaks. No, that one's still good. And then my guess is this right GPR one that's probably broken. I don't know how though. I just find it hard to believe that it's all these string ones, but maybe, maybe it is. Let's actually just get rid of like all these, but two of them. Whoops. See if that works. That seems to have worked. Again, run all of them.
Oh. I do see some junk on some of these. To something. This one didn't didn't break. Which ones which ones did? What's a good one? GU broke. Peace to you. BEQ one seems to break. Whoops. That's that's a really interesting symptom. What did this do before? That's a good question. Just does test N. So at some point when I add a couple of these, it breaks. What if I just add a different version of these? Then it breaks in a different way. <laughs> That's not inspiring confidence. If I just have this one, this break? Nope, so it seems to be when I have all these, it breaks. No idea why. It'd be nice to actually know if this was a read or write. So I'm gonna add that in the sim. Okay, so it was a read. And why that is, I'm not sure. I think it might be duplicate labels, but I don't think so because in this case, these would all be there's there's there might be several of these uh, macro invocations in the test, but I think they're going to be all serialized, and this only ever jumps forward. So I was sitting here like checking to see if maybe like are we test fail or for example would have those, but I don't think I don't think that's the case. Actually, it might because are we test fail doesn't seem to be in my code at least. Or was that here? Let me test fail. No, I think this is probably in here. This does have one one label here. But uh ooh, are we test sync? What's that doing? It does a fence. That should be fine. I think I just have fences as as no ops. I could double check that, but I'm pretty sure that's how they're implemented. Oops. Here. Yeah, just make them no ops. Ecall's not implemented, but where, do you see that somewhere? Oh, that's in pass. Pass, I think I override in here. Maybe I don't actually. Oh yeah, I never, I never invoke pass. 
at the end of the test, I just do this. But fail I invoke. Does, does fail do that? It does do ecall at the end here, doesn't it? Yeah, that's true. Well. Let's let's try this then. Yeah, that didn't help. <laughs> That's kind of what I suspected, but still, we do we do actually want to fix that. That's a good catch, uh, because yeah, ecall is not implemented. So know what this SW sig is doing. Not sure. But yeah, it definitely seems to be something else. I wonder actually if it's this branch. Maybe I'm not having enough bits for my branch. I don't think that's the case, but it'd be something to double check because this would add a lot of code here. So if we open this test up in, in, in the hex editor again, this this is now a different test that I'm using, right? So I'm doing a uh, BEQ. The code should be quite a lot larger in lines, all that stuff. Now, I would expect that if this were out of range for the architecture, then the compiler should give an error. But it might be that we end up branching to a bad place or something. Trying to jump over this code. So I'm just going to double check that uh, just to be sure. Would not be that surprised to find a bug like this at this point. Maybe it took the wrong bits of the branch, for example. So looking at this, you can see all of these immediates here. There's this 13 bit immediate. Um, it even says four to one. I guess the last bit's always zero because that way you would support the 16-bit instructions as well with the same encoding. Um, and instructions are never smaller than that in risk 5 So maybe that's it. So anyway, this is the... Let's actually just look for branch in the code. So yeah, I think I have this PC plus the branch offset. And then the branch offset up here should match this. So we have... In this case, this bit 12 is going to be bit 31. And then I have that repeated 19 times. Because 19 plus... Nineteen plus 13 is, uh, is 32, so I think that's correct. And I can also see a concat m dot low at the end, so that's the zero there. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we have this repeated 19 times, and then it's 4 to 1 and then 11. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Should be the next one we see. What happened here? Why do we take bit 31 and then do bit 31 again? That seems weird. Doesn't it? Let me pull up the other part of the spec here. Control transfer. Branch, here we go. Don't 
little bit B immediate in code sign offsets multiple two bytes. You also assign extended and added to the address of the branch to get the target address. So yeah, so again, looking at, at what it says here, we have offset 12. In fact, here's the yeah offset 12. And then 11 should be down here, which should be bit seven. So we have 31 repeated 19 times, and then we should have this seven bit. And then we have bits 30 and 25, which I think makes sense. And then we have bits 11 down to eight. Inclusive. And then we have zero at the end. I feel like this makes sense, but then this should probably actually give an error when it builds the sim because that shouldn't be 32 bits. And there it says that signals have different bit widths, 32 and 31. Thanks, Kaze. So then what am I doing wrong here? I'm also gonna search, uh, cause there, I think there was a, yeah, there's these U immediates. Uh, I think there's a good definition of what those are. Yeah, here's what a U immediate is. But isn't it the branch immediate that, that we're looking for here? I think that's what we want for this. So this branch immediate here, this branch offset. And I think the J immediate might be similar, but I'm not actually sure. We should double check these. But this branch offset at least should be, yeah, bit 31 and that should be repeated. 31 minus 12 plus one times. 31 minus 12 plus one times, which is actually 20. Okay. That might be the issue. And then we have bit seven, and then we have bits 30 down to 25 inclusive, and then we have 11 to eight inclusive, and then we have a zero at the end. And if this works, I'm checking all of these. Okay, this still, this still attempted write down mapped address. I think this is the same address as it was before too. But I also think that this is now better than it was. <laughs> we see also there's this repeat 20 in other places. So I think that this is correct either way, but there still is probably another issue. Just while I'm here though, I am gonna check these other values. Uh, so let's look at I immediate and that's gonna be 31 repeated again 20 times uh, actually wait a minute it's 31 down to 11 so this should actually be I think 21 e. <laughs> yeah and then these are bits 30 down to 20 I think that's correct for the I immediates, which might also explain this. Oh boy. Still same error, but I'm pretty sure I had these wrong before because, and we can see it with this notation too, which is actually kind of nice because if we look at, for example, I immediate, all these ranges are inclusive, these bit ranges here. So this would be this bit 31 should go from 31 to 11 inclusive. Which is 21 bits. And then in this case we have 30 down to 25 and this is going to match the 
the encoding in Kaze here. So for the I immediate, we have yeah 31 repeated 21 times. And then we can cat that with, in this case, we see 30 to 25, 24 to 21, and then 20. So if we take 30 down to 20 inclusive, which is what we do here, that should be correct. Uh, I'll double check all these other ones again. So for U immediate, we see 31, then 31 to 20, and then 19 to 12. Or 31, then 30 to 20, and then 19 to 12. And then 12 bits of zero. So 31 down to 12 plus 12 bits of zero. 31 down to 12 plus 12 bits of zero. Okay. That looks good. So now it looks like we've gotten branches u immediates now let's double check the jump offset here and so i also see another 31 here which is surprising <laughs> so maybe we have this wrong and that might fix it right because there's this well it's a branch equal so i'm not actually sure but maybe another jump breaks because of this so that could be anyway for this we have this jump offset so the j immediate is which i'm assuming that's what this jump offset is Looking at this, this looks fairly complicated, and I see that this does too, so that's probably a good sign. <laughs> uh, so for this, yeah, this probably was bad copy-paste. Uh, we have 31 repeated, so this goes 31 down to 20, which should be 12, I think. Uh, so already a discrepancy there, potentially. So 30 repeated 12 times, and then we can concatenate that with not 31. I have no idea where that came from. Um, yeah, probably bad copy paste from this or something. So then we have 19 down to 12, which is this. And then we have bit 20. And then we have 30 down to 25. What? No. Yeah, 31, 30 down to 25. And then 24 down to 21. So we could take that as 30 down to 21 inclusive. And then there is a zero bit. Am I missing one here? 20, 30 to 25. Wait, did I just mess up the wrong one? No, let's do this again. 31 repeated. 31 minus 20 is 11 plus one is 12. It's 12 times. And then we have 19 to 12. And then we have bit 20 on its own. And then we have 30 down to 21. And then we have low at the end. But that's not the right width, is it? Seems to be. We're still getting that unmapped address, but I feel a bit better about that. So what are the other offsets? This is S immediate, which I'm guessing is store immediate. Uh, and is load offset actually different than that? I'm not sure. Look into that in a bit. But anyway, the U and the I. Did I double check I? Just to be sure I will. Now again. I immediate is 30. 21 times and then 30 to 20. Yeah, that's an easy one. Um, so store offset or S immediate, we have 31 repeated. 31 minus 11 is 20 plus 1 is 21. Now I'm wondering if the branch offsets are actually correct here. I think they actually are because I can see in the data sheet uh, or in the spec, there's this one bit difference here. So with J and B, this is going to be repeated 20 times. And with the other ones, we get 21. Here we see J and B. Or that wasn't correct. <laughs> I and S should be 21. And B, for example, should be 20. Yeah, B is 20. And then what did I say? I and S are 21. Yeah. Okay. So then 
30, repeat it 21 times, and then we have not 31 down to 25. The hell are you doing, man? Uh, and then 11 to 7, which should be correct for the S immediate. I'm so glad I'm spending extra time testing this. It seems like I need another pass of just going over all this stuff again. I'm wondering about these load immediates too. I'm guessing that these are going to be... I'm guessing this is going to be exactly the same issue here. In fact, isn't it a bit strange that load and store end up with different numbers of bits? Maybe. I'm going to go back to that table again. And we'll just double check all these again because it's worth it. <clears throat> so let's look at a load. And yeah, the load actually does have a lot less here. It just says immediate 11 down to zero for the load. I mean, it is an offset anyway. Oh, and actually the loads and the stores do have the same number of bits for the for the offset. It's 12 bits in both cases. It's just that the store, it's split up in between different fields. Which looks like what we see here, actually. So we have 31 down to 21 in both cases. No, not for stores. Oh yeah, no, that that's because it, it uh, sign extends. That's why it repeats those. So then it's 30 down to 20 in the case of uh, loads and 30 to 25 in the case of stores with this 11 down to seven being the last parts. So these actually are the same length. It just uses different fields for the stores. So I'm pretty confident about that. Uh, for the jump offset, Looks like it's different than jump and link. So I'm actually going to look at that in the other area. Um, yeah, so we have jump and link and jump and link register, which I think both um, have slightly different encodings. So we'll just check those one by one. So jump and link. This uses the jump offset, whereas the JLR is I immediate. I immediate is also used for immediate computation. does say indirect JLR uses the I type, which I think is what this means, whereas jump and link has its own encoding, I think. Okay, so JLR uses the I immediate, and we'll double check that again, but I think we got that one right now. So we have
Let's just jump in Link. Or do I have these wrong? Ugh, this is so confusing. J-A-L-R uses I-type. We'll just look at that. Uh, in this case... Set 11 down to 0. Target address is obtained by adding the sign extended 12 bit media to the register. Yeah, so this repeated 21 times and then 30 down to 20 is what we want. Because this will go from 20 to 31 inclusive, but then sign extend. And that's that's the right number of bits. Okay, I'm happy with that. So then JAL does something a little bit differently, which use this jump offset the way I wrote it. I don't think anything else does. I think jump and link has its own stupid encoding. I might want to move this out actually into that one instruction if that's the only place it's used, but we'll stick with this for now. So JL is going to have um, 31 repeated down here, and then we're going to have Nineteen to twelve, and then we have twenty, and then thirty to twenty-one. Yeah, that looks good to me. So I think I think we validated these. Pretty much. I'm just going to check the branch ones one more time. But I think we're going to be okay with this. Yeah, 12 bit B immediate, it's called. That's multiples of two bytes. Yeah, JL is J immediate, and that's two bytes. So I wanted to double check J immediates and B immediates or whatever they're called. So first the J immediates, I'll just double check that one last time and then the B immediates. So J immediates, we have 31 repeated 12 times. And then we have, so this J immediate, yeah, 19 to 12, then 20, then 30 down to 25 and then 24 down to 21, and then a zero. Great. And then, finally, the uh, B immediate. Uh, B immediates have 31 repeated. 31 to 12 is, is this right? B immediate. 31 minus 12 is 19 plus 1 is 20. Yep, that makes sense. And then we have bit 7. Then we have bits 30 to 25. Yep, and then we have bits 11 to 8, and then a 0 bit. Okay. All right, so I'm pretty confident with these now, um, even though we still have issues. Might have to start digging in the dis in the disassembly now, which is not bad because we can comment out most of it and then make it tractable. And now you can see we have a bunch of the tests that fail. Let's just again pick one of these that we know fails, like add.
And I want to see actually, there's our halt thing. If we just do, for example, this, then it should pass. At least it should run, right? But it won't. It won't pass. So that is is correct. Let's put it after this assert GPRIQ. Thanks for the sub, Dark Second. Appreciate it. And then that worked. I'm a bit surprised at that, but okay. Oops. Stick that here. Okay, that also worked. Oops. Why do I keep just totally m missing on my keyboard here? Um, let's go ahead and like binary search this. Okay, that broke, right? Yeah. So then we'll go up here a bit. And that finished. Oops. Now I don't remember where we were. That's annoying. Okay, that didn't work again. That didn't work. And that did work. So let's continue then. That's test three, right? Just make sure that this works. Again, yeah, and that did. Ugh! Why is that in my history? Uh, three, let's try this. That also worked. Although I'm noticing it's not printing out stuff, which seems strange to me. That didn't work. And yeah, that shouldn't have worked then if the last one didn't. So I think it's this test case 13 where it breaks. And it might be unrelated to the test case itself, which I suspect it is because these did run when we didn't have that debugging. And it is also still quite interesting that it doesn't print anything out before it breaks because we have several prints before this, like these right strings, and I would have expected that those would work. So I have a feeling that this is actually wrong in some other way. So if I do this, for example, oh, that still didn't print. Oh, whoops, that did pop which we do not want it to do in that case. Yeah, so here now, it, now it's sort of printing those things. So something's weird. And if I do something like this, where I remove most of that code, then we see Tests one, two, three are complete. And then I believe we should be able to take this halt here and move it. I just don't want to lose what's in my in my buffer here. Actually, we can just take that. That's fine. But now we can remove that and then probably the whole thing works again. Yeah, so I don't think it has to do with that test code in particular. Um I think it's the something to do with memory. I wonder how big actually that this, uh, how big this ROM actually is when we do this. Why did that work? I mean, I know it didn't actually work, but still, why did it look like it worked? That should have just broken. That's annoying. 
Uh, if I open the, let's add one here. It's not that big. How big did I make my program ROM in the test here? 64K or something? Oh, that's too small. That's probably the issue. If we make this 64K, and then I need to make sure the linker script can handle that. That might be it. Linker script says this is 64K, yeah, so I probably just have the mapping wrong in the sim. And then we just end up triggering that when we add a bunch of this extra debug code. It's probably something like that's happening. Here we even say this length is this, but the index is this, which is weird. I mean, I do know looking at the size, this is about, this does look like that 37392, whatever. Oh, I totally masked this wrong, by the way. First of all. Okay, now we're getting prints. <laughs> uh, I wonder if that was it then. Let's again run all these just to make sure that we can. And then I want to like introduce a failure so that it prints out the register like we want it to do. But my guess is that that's the issue, is that I I was masking off too many bits. So the compliance halt thing is actually not quite correct uh, because uh, we want it to signify failure. Ooh, this is interesting. SRL fails now. What? Yeah, look at that, look at that. We actually had an assertion violation. That's cool. I don't know if it's true, but it's cool. But yeah, so it's, it says here, test complete and then success. And we actually want to um, fail in a different way. So what I want to do is, let's see, in this test, so test halt here. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah, unfortunately, there wasn't a good way to to kill it by overriding these macros, but that's actually fine uh, because what we can do is have this. I think this will end up being defined twice if we do it this way, but let's just see what we get. Uh, Not pretty how I've ended up putting this code together, but that's, I don't really care. So now this loads some stuff and dumps this fail address. And if we load one here, I think this will make the simulator report that as failure. Yeah, here it goes, fail return code one. That's cool. 
And then the one thing I'm going to do in addition to that is I think the make file in the compliance test repo right now uh, has this true thing here. And let's not do that. So then if if the simulator crashes, we it ends up reporting that as well, which is kind of cool. Although I don't think it killed anything. I don't think it stopped running when I did that, but but yeah. But that's actually cool that it hit, hit an assert. Then we don't need to test that that works. Um, unless, of course, it hit this assert by mistake, which I'd be a little bit surprised. But it also just might be that we're still doing something wrong here, so that's quite okay. Here's the cool part about this. This now tells us it was in SRL1, line 49. We can see what this is. By the way, isn't it so sick that this assertion is being printed out by the, the simulated CPU? Like, I just think that's inherently cool. <laughs> like you, you can't really distinguish the output from the test versus the simulator itself. But this is actually coming from inside the test code, which I think is really nice. So let's go ahead and look at this. SRL. <laughs> yeah. This would be a great sacrifice to the abstraction god. Um, and again, this told us line 49, and we should see that indeed, test case three, you see test number one, and that is in that block. So X3, which is here, and it wanted to be this, and it got this, or did it get this and it wanted to be this? I'm guessing it got this and wanted to be this because it's, maybe not, I don't know actually, SRL. Not entirely sure what it's trying to do here, so that's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, but yeah, I think it got this value and then wanted to be this value. So if we expand this out, Or what was it called? Test RR op. George RR R. Martin. Uh, I think where where were these test macros? Here. So I need to pull this to another window. Sorry that you guys can't see it, but I guess our op in this case has the instruction is the first argument and the second argument is the destination register. These are reg one and reg two. So probably the, yeah, the operands for the instruction. And I'm not entirely sure if these are expected. they are supposed to have a certain value. Oh no, it, it actually loads these. So that's great. And then the values, correct val, val one and val two. So it looks like it's trying to do This shifted to get this? Reg one and reg two. And that's gonna be value one and value two. So it takes this shifted by this. And it's also a logical shift, which means I actually don't understand at all how it's supposed to get this value. It's not going to rotate, so. I would expect 7F, which is, I think, what we end up getting.
So yeah, it loads this register with this value, and then this register with this value, and then performs a shift where this is R1, this is R2, and this is the destination. There's actually one more argument here than in the definition for this. Am I in the right one? Doesn't seem to be. There's five test macros, compliance, test, compliance, IO. So this should include this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten arguments. And we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, no, that is correct. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good. And then, so we have the op, or the instruction, and the destination again, and reg one and two, and then the correct value, which I still find strange. And then value one, value two. Uh, and I don't know what these other regs are. SW reg, offset, and test reg. This is probably the results and the offset into the results. Not entirely sure what this test reg is. There's a test case macro somewhere. Oh, it stores this there first, I think. So maybe this is supposed to be zero or something. This is really strange, actually. And also, I don't totally understand where the assertion is here. Is that in test case? Yeah, it's in the test case macro expands to that. So at the end of this, it stores. the destination register, which is what we want. That looks good to me. Oh yeah, I think this is just for the Yeah, I think this X6 ends up being the uh, like the unused register that we get into here. And then the register and then the expected value. And then that then it all makes sense.
but I'm not sure this code makes sense. This seems like the wrong expected value, to be honest. Very strange. Because yeah, I'd expect this shift right four would be this seven F, and I think that's what we get here. But yet, if we Hack that, then this test fails. So again, here we have the instruction, the destination. No, yeah, reg one and reg two. The correct value, value one and value two. You know what? This must be like maybe this value saturates or something. Or I'm actually not sure. Because if it's value one, value two, reg one and reg two. So in this case, it's value one, value two. So it's this shift right, because we're in SRL, right? Yeah, shift right by this. And if this were masked, why would this value get bigger? That makes no sense to me. I must not be interpreting these correctly. Let me look up SRL again in the data sheet here. Logical shift left, logical right, and arithmetic shifts. So logical right is SRL. Value and register RS1 by the shift amount held in the lower five bits of register two. So, and then we, I have another reference I'll open here that shows that it's destination of one and then two is the argument order. So here I see there's this RR op here and here we see it goes load reg one, like reg one, load reg two, and then the instruction into the destination from one and two. So this is the shift amount, one, two, three, four is the shift amount, uh, which gets loaded by value two here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the shift amount. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then this is the, this is the value that's gonna shift. So somehow one F here, which is 31, 
this shift right 31 bits is the same as a shift left. I have a hard time accepting that because I didn't realize this was supposed to rotate. Seems really fucky, you guys. <laughs> I like this too. shift right by this by 16 what the hell is going on here I thought SRR was shift right logical. I didn't think there were any rotates because it says here SLL, SRL, and SRA, right? And that, that would make sense just, just by reading these three. It makes sense if this was shift left logical, shift right logical, and shift right arithmetic. And then it says logical left, logical right, and arithmetic shift right. So I'm assuming SRL is the right shift. So then what are some, what are some other cases here? I'm going to ignore this one with this negative value in it. But one shift right zero is one. I'm on board with that. Zero shift right whatever is going to be zero. I'm on board with that too. This one we're still debating. <laughs> zero shift right eight is going to be zero. Whatever. Or no, yeah, zero shift right eight is going to be zero. 800 hex shift right 31. Is one thousand? Maybe that maybe the shift amount gets sign extended or something. But why would it do that? Why would you have negative shift values? So if we look at a case like negative one here, the test will load reg two with negative one. Negative one is all Fs, right? And all Fs, if you just took the lowest five bits, would be 31. And so then this shift right by 31 is somehow this, a logical shift right, which makes no sense to me. The only thing I see making sense is that the top bit is clear here, and then when you shift right, if you've shifted right by 31, you would get the bottom bit clear here, but then why are these top bits set? What the hell am I missing? I'm going to do a couple things here. I'm going to 
uh, inline this to see if see if it gets any different. Hopefully it doesn't, right? So if we do this. Whoops, that is not the correct way to do this, is it? No, it is not. Because we need this. So inst becomes SRL. Dest reg becomes X3. Reg 1 becomes X28. Reg 2 becomes X13. Correct val becomes this. Val 1 becomes this. Val 2 becomes this. SW reg is this 5 here. 12 is this offset. And then the test reg is x6. Okay, if we do this, we should get the same result. We do now, it says line 54, which I think is fine. So now let's let's expand this mask X len thing. There's this underscore underscore risk risk five X len, which should be thirty one in this case. I'm just gonna do this since we know these fit. Let's just remove it and again see that we see the same result, which we should. And then that is enough verification. Yeah, so we get the same same issue. So now if I expand this test case macro, which is gonna be this, so this is what we want. So it's gonna run the code, which is all this stuff. So we'll go ahead and expand that in there. No worries. Then let's sort of expand everything else here. So test reg is going to be x6. Dest reg is going to be x3. Correct val is going to be this guy. SW reg is x5 and offset is 12. We might see it fail on a different line now because we should see it fail on line 54. But other than that, this should this should be the same. And indeed it is, line 54. Just to be sure, I want to make sure it says line 55 now. And it does. Good. Just to, ver whoops. Just to verify that assumption that this is still rebuilding. Um, okay, so now I don't think we need to expand this further because I think that's behaving correctly. Uh, we want to check that x3 is this value. And if we even just look at this, that's exactly what this will do. Checks that this is this value. If they are, it skips everything. So I think that's okay. But then why does this not produce the result I expect? And also, why did this work before I added all this printing stuff? Because I had this test passing last night. So... Ah. 
Actually, wait a minute. Did I have these passing? References. SRL. Yeah, that looks like what I have, right? No, they are different, but it might actually be that the ones before this were the same. 0001007F. Or let's actually just check if it's from here onward, it might actually make sense. 00765001. Yeah, it looks. This stuff all looks good. Oh, okay. Actually, I think I know why it seems to fail in the actual output. And I think that's because I don't think we dump the any of this state when the assertion fails. So that probably explains that. But it doesn't explain why this is not the value we expect. Now, the interesting thing is, I do notice it doesn't actually do the check unless it's doing this assertion. So if we don't do this assertion, uh, or if we if we make this quiet again, it probably passes. And it does. And the thing with that is that this this is still writing the value to the output. I actually think that this expected value is wrong in the test, you guys. And in fact, we can verify that. We can verify that by running that OVP sim thing. Uh, if we test this same test with, you need to look up the OVP sim thing. Uh, And now it's running all that. Uh, and we want to run that with this quiet thing back in, which that means we need to go into its device thing and undefined quiet here. Look at that. Bang. Okay. It's a bug in the test. I think I'm going to raise an issue for this. Do you guys agree? Because this looks pretty clear to me. <clears throat> Can't imagine why it would suppose why it would fail on purpose. Yeah, also I just found <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh, so I just w open the issue tab here for the RISC V compliance repo, and I see this one from 18 days ago. It says the AOIPC test writes signature to wrong address, and this should be also what I saw. So that's so a good point to the signature. Consequently, the reference there is unchanged from the initial one is always correct. Yeah, that might actually be something else.
Is there a PR for that? That he made? Yep. <laughs> I bet this fixes those issues for the uh for the AOIPC test. And I bet if this were merged I wouldn't I could uh get rid of those those writes to the uh or get rid of the code that allows uh the test to write to program ROM in my simulator. All right, what to call this? Oops. I'm going to run all the tests, by the way, because I want to see which ones are wrong here. Normally I wouldn't contribute right away like this, but I'm just quite sure that I'm right here. <laughs> and I also think this is a really useful suite. So I would like to, uh, to support this. Okay, it seems to just be that one test. This is RV32i as well.
feel like a good Samaritan by doing this. Because in the end, this helps me, right? Like, if, if I vetted all, that all this is correct, then... Then I've done I've done a good job for my CPU and for everyone else's. So I want to do one more thing with this before I move on, and that is that I want um, I want this to not fail now and just output the error. And that way we should see uh, what other assertions fail here. Although I should do this, well, I'll do it in mine. Uh, uh oh, it did something weird. Uh, it, maybe it ended up clobbering some registers here or something. Okay, this might be a dead end. Let's go the other way and we'll run their sim still. And now we'll actually comment out stuff in the test. Line 60. Line 61, even. Line 62. This is kind of wild. Oops. 
wanted this one. This is so frustrating, you guys. <laughs> Land 74. Land 75. Line seventy six. Line seventy seven. Man, there's a lot of these. This is this is not good. I paste that one already? Yeah, I did. Did that? That failed. 78 also. Yeesh. I'm gonna be exhaustive here. Oh, come on, you guys. Four. Oh, five. Seventeen now. <laughs> One eighteen. Oh, boy. One nineteen. Twenty. One thirty. <laughs> this is tiring. Yeah, okay, there there it is. So if we looked at like any one of these, 60 for example, if we took 80 and we shifted it left 31, I shifted it right 31, we should end up with zero. And what do we get for that one on line 60? We get zero. And for this test case, if we took this and we shifted right 16, that would be hex 765. And we should see that here.
then if we want to be good Samaritans, we can get check out just five target number five test suite. I'm just going to run mine again just to make sure it only fails in that one way. And I'm pretty sure it does. And if that's the case, I can throw together a PR for this issue. And then I got to stop streaming that this went way too late. <laughs> Is it just SRL? Yeah. So here's what I'm going to do to handle this. I'm going to do a git add dash p. And I'm pretty sure all of these changes that I made today were correct. And then we're going to go to test with five compliance. No. Oh yeah, let's just get fetch. Stop trying to make fetch happen. Why? I know it's not. <laughs> Let's just do this. Take this commit. That'll do. What? Maybe I had force pushed that last night. And we'll just commit that again. That should work. I hate some modules, you guys. Um, why is there untracked content? Uh, 
I uh, cannot type. There we go. So now the last thing I'm going to do here Get remote set your no get remote add upstream and that should be risk five risk five compliance. So git at github.com risk five risk five compliance dot git git fetch upstream which should all be here. Uh, log and down here we should see this is upstream master. So if we do get check out this one and we can do get check out dash B fix SRL. Then what we can do is here we can do make and I think I need to specify risk five prefix. And also risk five devices are a three two I. And then the prefix is in my master. I changed that to be this. And everything should work. And then what we want to do is we want to go back into this one comment this out and then we should see that it breaks again in the same way and then I'm just gonna fix them all make a PR for that what's happening here It's just passing more. That's all it's doing. <laughs> Probably going to run all of them again, but whatever. Actually, no, not whatever, because we only really want to see that that one fails. Uh, what was it again? S. ISRL. Okay, and then like this. There it fails, as expected, and that's because it breaks before it can write that data back to the host. Also, this says line 49, so I might as well update this actually. That's going to be the correct one. Which means these are going to be all wrong, aren't they? I can update them as I want, or as, as we fix them. So first of all, line 49 should be 7F. Line 60 should be zero. I'm gonna be pretty happy if all these lines are correct anyway, which I think they're gonna be actually. 
765. Seems that they are correct, so that's good. And this isn't a bad way to, to fix these tests either, just literally run them in what's supposed to be the right simulator and update all these. So I think I think we're we're doing good work here. Uh, this is gonna be zero again. And fails on seventy five. Line 76 fails with this value. Seventy seven should be one. Seventy eight should be F F F. Should it be? Hmm. It seems weird, actually. It is testing about registers. So I'm pretty sure it is that one. But then I expected this value. But if we shifted this, well, it's negative, actually. I still don't actually understand why this gives that result. That's a strange one. Let's come back to that one. Ninety two should be seven F. One of three should be zero. One oh four should be seven six five. One oh five should be zero. By the way, I'm just going to do this, do this blindly. One seventeen should be zero. Uh, one eighteen should be oh eight. Also, I think the other place I did this was inconsistent with the style here, so we'll fix that up. Uh, and then where did this fail? 119. That seems like a weird result, doesn't it? I guess actually, maybe these aren't that weird because these are negative input values. So I'm probably just not interpreting those right. And then it makes sense. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with these. Um, I think that's sort of the key. 130 should be FFF. -F -F. Zero XFF. 
and this pass now. So if we run all of these, I think they should all pass now. Also, I wanted to uh, risk five ISA is RV three two I just to make sure we're not testing anything extra. Great. The last diff should be that, so we'll take a check out the rest five target like that. Yeah. Okay. And I think they also require you to add attribution. So like if you look at this guy's pull request, which I think is this one, right? No, that's mine. Oops. Yes, there's a change log here that we should edit as well. So let's do that. Twenty twenty oh two oh six. Jake Taylor, and this will be yep, Ferris at Gmail. And what is we use here? Spaces. Yeah, it looks like they do this. So we'll do the same thing. And my issue was 81. Do that. Hi, I'm almost done. Almost done? Yeah, like a minute.
origin fix SRL. And then finally I'll open the pull request and then I'll be done. Then I'll just make sure I link that. One. There we go. All right. <laughs> uh. Okay, so I think that's good. Now I'm going to head off. Thanks, guys, for hanging out, and I'll see you next time.